Hello, everyone. I'm Tiffany Smith, and I am so excited to be here to talk about The Suicide Squad. I, like all of the press here today, got to see the movie, and I have literally been counting down the minutes to talk with anyone about it. And who better to do that with than the cast and filmmakers? So let's jump right in and introduce everyone that we've got. Please welcome Margot Ravi, Idris Elba, John Cena, Joel Kinnaman, Jai Courtney, David Dasmalchin, Daniela Melchior, Michael Rooker, Alisi Braga, Pete Davidson, Joaquin Casio, Juan Diego Boto, Nathan Fillion, <laughs> Mei Ling Ung, Flula Borg, with Mr. Sylvester Stallone, producers Charles Roven and Peter Safran, and director writer James Gunn. Woo! There we nice. go. All right. <laughs> First off, I have to say, I'm so thankful for Zoom because I don't know how we would have done this like 20 person panel any other way. <laughs> um, and just for everybody on here, we've got a bunch of people. We've got specific questions for some of you guys. We've got group questions. So just jump in wherever you can, wherever you want to. No, don't tell them to do that. That's not <laughs> yeah, that's not, uh, Well, maybe with a little asterisk, except Rooker. Yeah. yeah, that's true. I should have started this with talking I to you. I never jump like, in. You I, have slide any in. Tips. I slide in. I don't jump. I don't <laughs> jump. I just right. jump, but no, I just slide. Okay. All right. So, like I said at the top, it was really hard because I wanted to talk to people about the movie. So, the first question is for me, for you, James. When you knew all the like big stuff that you wanted to do in this movie, how hard was it for you not to just be like telling everybody, telling your friends, be like, this is what I'm going to do in this movie? Like giving away secrets that are in the plot, you mean? Yeah. Well, I'm used to that. I always want to tell everybody everything, and I always have to hold on to all these secrets. I've been, you know, doing, you know, big movies like this for a while now, and holding on to the secrets and the pain of that is a big part of what I do. But also, you're assuming that I didn't, Tiffany, and I did tell a lot of people <laughs> way too much information because I can't keep my mouth shut, you know. But uh, but really, you know, that it's, um, you know, I'm used to it. It's a muscle I've exercised quite a bit. I'm just gonna remind you that two of the producers are on here and you just were like, I told everybody. Yes. <laughs> the movie's already made, we're all good. <laughs> we, 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 we muzzled them a little bit. <laughs> yeah, but Chuck knows I'm an unattended fire hose. <laughs> <laughs> well, that leads me into my first question. It's from Italy. We have Antonio from Coming Soon and this one's for Charles and Peter and James. From our perspective as journalists and viewers, watching this film was an out of this world experience, something we'll never forget. From your perspective while making it, was the moment when you said to yourself, OMG, this is pure madness. This is something I will never forget. I, I felt like that, the whole, like, I felt like that the whole time. I could not believe that I went in with an idea that stayed stable from the first time I pitched it to the guys at Warner's, you know, with, with Peter and Chuck to the very end. But I think that, just the fact that I knew that I was being entrusted with this enormous amount of freedom on such a big budget movie, I really did feel a huge responsibility to people to do it the best I could. But also because I was being given so much freedom, I felt the responsibility to take risks. And making movies at this level, it does seem like big movies are the ones that people are going to see in theaters. And if, if they don't continue to take risks and change and try new things, then people aren't going to want to be coming to the theaters. If it's the same boring three-act structure every time, people are going to get bored. So I really, uh, I, I felt grateful. I felt a sense of magic. I felt a sense of, of purpose and a sense of uh, almost, you know, destiny the whole time we were making the movie. And Peter and Chuck, when did you guys say OMG? Because I'm sure those letters came out of your mouth. <laughs> the, the first time James came in and pitched the idea that, one of the primary characters was going to be a 200 foot pink starfish. Once you get over that, once you get over that, there's nothing else he's going to do that's going to surprise you. Like once, once you've bought in on the, on the starfish, everything else is fair game. So there were, there were no real, uh, there was no real concern. And James oh, is right. On, what he came in and pitch is you exactly. That he wanted me in his movie again? That was much scarier than the two. <laughs> That's true. We fought him more on, on casting you, Rooker, than we did on the starfish. Right. What about well, for you, Charles? Well, uh, the amazing thing about it was it was a consistent escalation of the OMG. 
First we heard the pitch, right? And then we heard how James wanted to execute the script and each step of the execution, oh, we're doing that. Oh, 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 and we have to like do that. And so um, it was a constant upping of the wow and the difficulty and um, it was a fantastic experience. Love that. All right, our next question is from the Philippines. Tristan from The Rappler asks James, you've been known to get the most obscure comic book characters and make them endearing fan favorites. How exactly do you select the characters you bring to life on screen? Well, I, just, I selected them all in very different ways. I mean, I knew I needed this kind of story I needed to tell. And, you know, there were some characters like, you know, Harley, who I, you know, wanted to put in the movie and, and Boomer and these characters that I liked a lot and I liked the actors who played them. Um, but then there were other characters like Polka Dot Man. And I really wanted to use a, a character who was thought of as a lame supervillain. And I literally, you know, put into Google who is the dumbest supervillain of all time. And Polka Dot Man always came up near the top. And being able to take a character like that and then give him heart was fun for me. I love rats. So Rat Catcher was a, an easy one. I, I wrote, you know, I wrote Bloodsport for Idris. I wanted to work with Idris. I wanted Idris to star in this movie. So it wasn't a matter so much of, of who the character was. It was let's find a character who's obscure, who we can build as our own cinematic creation for Idris. So every character was different. Yeah, you know, the conversation about, but the first, the first conversation was about me playing Rat Catcher. That was a really short conversation. <laughs> Gonna moved up very quickly. <laughs> I have to ask, like hearing James give the descriptions, David, for you, where he's like, "What's the lamest character?" And he's like, "David, how about you?" And then he's like, "I want to work with Idris. Whatever character." <laughs> how did that feel? Uh, that conversation go for each of you guys? No, no, that's not true. He really <laughs> first said he wanted me to be Superman. And then we had to go a different direction. No, the truth of the matter is, I was very embarrassed because James, when he told me he wanted me to be in his film, first I freaked out. I couldn't believe I was gonna get to be in a, in a film that James is gonna make, let alone the Suicide Squad. But he said, Abner Krill. And I was like, ah. and he's like, Polka Dot Man. And I'm like, I, I was so embarrassed because James knows how much I love comic books and I've spent my life collecting comic books. And I had no, freaking clue who Polka Dot Man was. And James is like, don't worry, dude. read the script and uh, and and you'll see. And um, I read the script and it was, um, I, I couldn't believe it. Couldn't you know what's so to... weird? When I first read the script, without having had a single conversation with James or anyone else, no one else was announced or cast, I read Polka Dot Man with Dave in my head. And I've never met Dave Desmalchian until this movie either. And when I spoke to James, I was like, so is anyone else on board yet? And he's like, David Desmalchian is going to be Polka Dot Man. I was like, that is exactly who I pictured. So I don't know what this says about Dave, but I'm so happy it was him. That's right. I forgot about that. That's totally true. We were in your house in Los Angeles. Yeah. It was That's so right. Deep. I forgot about that. Yeah. It was meant to be. So I know, obviously, we get to meet a bunch of new characters in this movie, but there is obviously characters that we know before. And this question is actually for you, Margo, from USA. Francisco at Cine Express asks, being that this is the third time you portray Harley Quinn, what were some of the traits and emotions you were most excited to play with and explore through your performance this time around? P.S. Loved your gracias. <laughs> <laughs> um, I loved getting to play Harley, who was in the mindset of like single and ready to mingle. Um, she, I hadn't played that version of Harley before. She's always, I've been very committed to Mr. J or just fresh out of a breakup with Mr. J. And um, James put in a lot of very funny potential love interests throughout the throughout the film. Uh, it doesn't always end well, obviously, but uh, that was that was kind of fun. And also to play a Harley who was, yeah, kind of in mission mode. And uh, anytime she's in a new group, there's always something fun and new to do because she reacts differently based on who who her other teammates are. So I was just looking forward to seeing what the group ensemble was going to be and what vibe everyone was going to bring and what that would bring out in Harley. Yeah. Well, I think that's the thing that maybe the comic book fan too that you love so much about Suicide Squad is seeing 
how different characters interact with each other in different situations. And Macarena from Argentina actually has a question about that from La Casa for John and Idris. This competition we see between Peacemaker and Bloodsport is one of the funniest things in the movie. How was it for you guys to work on this dynamic between your characters? Idris, go ahead, go for it. Uh, it was, uh, first of all, can I just say, hey, Sly, I love you, brother. I'm a big fan. Uh, likewise, um, it's a very sophisticated acting group here, except for Mike. <laughs> Michael, I should have dropped you off that cliff years ago. But other than that, it's great. Uh, I love, I love you too, my friend. <laughs> um, it, it, was, uh, it was a really great experience to explore, if I'm honest. You know, it was one of the things that <clears throat> developed. As you know, when you read the script, you sort of see the uh, the natural uh, rivalry between John and I. Uh, and James and, and, you know, the natural dynamics of the whole team, John and I really sort of, you know, gravitated to this natural sort of dick swinging competition that was just a lot of fun. To, and then, you know, of course, you know, Viola, Dave up in the beginning, beginning sequence. So, you know, for us, it was really great fun. And James would really egg, you know, Idris and John on to make, you know, Peacemaker and Bloodsport really uh, pop on screen. I, I, I loved every minute of it. I'll say the same. I think if you look at the uh, personalities we have here, everybody, James has cast a very wide net. And on top of that, given everyone's superhero personalities that are uh, distinctly definable, except Bloodsport and Peacemaker, they're of the same skill set. And I think that really starts the fuel for the one-upsmanship. They really want to battle for that alpha position, whereas the other superheroes don't necessarily need to compete as much because they have definable characteristics. And I think that small journey between uh, Bloodsport and Peacemaker through, through the whole movie is, it, it really does make for some good comedic moments and some wonderful one upmanship Well, it's definitely, there's definitely some great moments. I'm like, I don't want to say too much. I'm like, there's great moments. That's all I'll say because I don't want to give any spoilers. <laughs> um, no, we next... don't want to talk about go, go, go. That's not a, you know, that's not a spoiler. We don't want to talk about that. Wait, what? Say again? We don't want to talk about John's tidy, tidy whitey scene. <laughs> no, bro, your dick is huge. It's a very small. It's a very no, small. Dog, you, I saw a screening of the movie. You have a huge piece, dude. Huge. Uh, <laughs> like, you <laughs> on a theater screen, and you may have been using a filter of some sort. <laughs> uh, I was like, no, no, no. John asked me to use a large penis filter on the cameras at all times for his. I don't even care, if you, James. I don't even care if you say that because it was it was literally just like my thumbnail. <laughs> and I you used guys, a small you penis all, lens. You guys are all wrong. Weasel. That wasn't even a penis, it was a log. Kind of. <laughs> this, I mean, I gotta say, there's definitely moments where the wardrobe stands out a lot. I'm just gonna say that. <laughs> His bulge is literally I'm just, I'm just with a, a group of so many talented characters and <laughs> actors and professionals. We just spent a good solid half a minute or more talking about my dick. Very nice. <laughs> hey. You know what? Action figures. Very focal point sometimes. <laughs> All right. I will take us in a different direction. Um, Rita, from <laughs> Rita from Portugal has a question for Daniela. Um, little is known about Ratcatcher 2, unlike other characters in the Suicide Squad roster. How did you develop the character? Um, and as a Portuguese actress in her first big American movie, what was it like to work with such an incredible cast on a story that is a comic book legend? I just had to pretend that I'm not uh, the biggest fan of them. I just had to pretend, oh yeah, it's uh, like another day in the office. But no, I was looking up at them uh, every day. <laughs> um, about Red Catcher 2, I was really happy that I had this freedom gave, uh, gave um, by James that I, like, I didn't have to stick or to glue to, uh, already existing uh, character from the movie, the comics. Um, so it was really interesting that we could work uh, on this super villain that she's just uh, started now. She doesn't know how to, how to kill, how to fight or how to anything at all because she doesn't want to 
also and because she has this huge art um so it was really interesting it was and i felt that it could be a good starting point to uh, like for something for a red catcher because it was really her first mission and oh. i hope not the last <laughs> <laughs> yeah but it was really really i i really i feel really really lucky to be with so good people so many good people and anytime you're intimidated, all you have to do is think about how much they talk about penis size and you're good to go. <laughs> no, but I never feel intimidated. I just feel like, yeah. The small callback. <laughs> so coming from a character that's new to the squad, we've got a question for a character that is not new to the squad. Joel, this one is for you from the US, Josh at the Nocturnal S. How did you get Rick Flagg to stand out through your performance with so many high concept characters and performances? Well, you know, we had a good script. So I was just so happy to, to get to do this sort of new version of Flagg that, that, that James wrote. And I got to spread some, uh, some comedic wings. And uh, yeah, you know, it was, it, was, uh, it, was, it was great to get to come in to us, you know, it's the second time I do it, but I felt like I was doing it for the first time. And uh, me and James had a couple of conversations early on and, you know, we decided that I was not gonna be bound by what we did in the first film and just let this be a new experience. And, um, and I just, I had, I had so much fun with it just to, you know, just, it, it, was, it was a completely new experience. And, and it felt like it was almost a new character. That's awesome. Um, our next question is for Mr. Sylvester Stallone. This is from Fred in the US Showbiz Cheat Sheet asks, you voiced animated characters in animated movies before. What was voicing King Shark in live action? Why was it different? And did you ask your fellow Guardians of the Galaxy, Vin Diesel and Bradley Cooper for any advice? <laughs> no on the last part, but <clears throat> I'm a big fan of seafood. So <clears throat> when I was offered this, I thought, oh, well, I mean, how do I pass it? I mean, I would have preferred to play a grouper, but I'll take what I can get. <laughs> I, I did pay. I, I paid him in bundles of crawfish. He me. did. He, 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 paid me, he paid me in worms and bait. <laughs> Everyone needed at the voiceover sessions for more reasons. They're like, he's eating fish again. Right? Put your mask no. on. <laughs> at least you got paid. <laughs> oh, that's right. I, I was about to bring that up. <laughs> Rooker had to pay me. <laughs> he has to pay you. I get it. I yeah. get it. Now I'm making my money. Um, all right. Our next question is from Tom at Time Out UAE. And this is for Charles and Peter. Um, this film has been created with the unique vision of James Gunn, where there is no rule book. So how was that dynamic in the production and scripting process in creating this vision for you guys? Well, I mean, it was, it, it was actually pretty easy because, you know, James came in with a real just unbelievable clarity of vision in terms of what he wanted to accomplish. So what he pitched to us that very first time is exactly what you see on the screen today. And it never changed. There was no there was no waffling he knew exactly what he wanted to do and you know so for chuck and, and myself it was simply about giving him the tools to do it and part of it was just giving him the freedom cast whoever he wanted uh you know shoot in whatever way that he wanted i mean it really was the studio gave him complete carte blanche and you know the movie you see is a result of that and uh, I, I think it's pretty evident we made the right choice in trusting him 100 percent to make this film it was kind of crazy, like out of the bigger films I've done, for some reason, they always seem to be the most chaotic and you're always doing like weeks of reshoots and overtime. I, mean, I don't think we did an hour of overtime and, and we didn't do any reshoots on this movie. So there, there, I really, I agree. There, you, everyone felt that there was this clarity of vision. Everyone knew that they were doing exactly, you know, the same film together. And, you know, it makes it just easy and fun. You just get to focus on what's important. Yeah. yeah, that's unfortunate sometimes because, you know, that's where I make my money in ADR, and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the great things about, about working <laughs> on this particular movie, despite the fact of, you know, the big canvas and everything and the big cast and everything, and even though James really did come in with a very specific vision, 
still, it was very collaborative with each of the characters, with the crew and everything. And, you know, James somehow did have everybody pulling together, but even within the pulling together, you were still allowed to do things um, that just kept elevating the experience. And so it was surprisingly, as much as we thought so much of it was daunting, it really wasn't. It was just really easy and fun and one of the most pleasurable experiences that I've ever had. <clears throat> Love that. Kind of jumping off of that one, we have a question from South Africa from Andrea at the Sunday Times Lifestyle. And this one is for Nathan. And I know that you've known James for a while. So what was it like working with him as a director on this one? That's Nathan. the only way I've ever worked with James is him telling me what to do. And uh, <laughs> what I'm comfortable with, you know, Peter brought up, he, Peter used the word trust. And I think that's, that's a, a really, a, what I'm watching here going on. Uh, I've never seen a, 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 someone like James get handed a, 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 a property like this and they just say, whatever you want, we trust you. And then James turns around and says, oh, I've got all these solid performing workhorses. I've got these solid performing thoroughbreds. I've got new talent. I've got all the, and they all trust implicitly what James is going to do. There's a lot of trust, go <laughs> cat hair, sorry. <laughs> There's a lot of trust going around here that I, I, it's so easy when someone has, like uh, Joel mentioned, a singular vision that you can all get on board with. It becomes easy. All that trust that James had for you went right out the window with that cat hair move, Nathan. I'm just going to say it right now. <laughs> this guy's a <laughs> Um, okay, our next question is from Brazil. Fabio at The Nerd Break asks, Flula, the movie is very funny and full of hilarious moments. For you, what was the funniest scene to film? And did anyone have a fit of laughter on the film set? I'm a man who uh, suffers from amnesia as soon as something happens. Um, as soon as someone yells cut, it's like someone takes a nice uh, two by four like Hacksaw Jim Duggan and hits me directly in the face. So I have no memories of anything that's happened except for the cupcake breaks, which I took after each scene. Um, so thank you again for the lemon poppy seeds. Nathan, yes. I'm gonna say it was your rant on the helicopter. Anybody tell me yes. if I'm wrong. Oh yeah, I mean, I think I Margo- I didn't stop yeah. laughing. Yeah. Margo, yeah. Jai, Rooker, uh, Pete, we were all John. Nathan. That, that, they had a conversation about, uh, Flula basically imagining Harley shit for that it took about on. three hours of filming that we just couldn't stop laughing and zero percent of it made it into the movie. Zero. So it was enjoyable for us for the day. Yeah. And you were even saying, James, you were even saying like, none of this is going to be in the yeah. film. <laughs> and we yeah. couldn't give it anyway because I kept burst out, bursting out laughing. So none of it could have been used. It was so... <laughs> It was so ridiculous and it went on for so long. Yeah. <laughs> well, much of it could be used because it would, the movie would be rated X. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I have to like, ask James for that question then where it's like, you're saying, you know, you spent hours where you're like, I know none of this is going to be used, but you finished on time every day. How do you as a director do that? Where you're like, okay, I know this is a moment where I can let them kind of, we can just have fun and have that friend vibe. Um, but make sure we're still getting the stuff done we need to get done. Well, that was a, I mean, like, honestly, that was a day that we were okay on. I, you know, I, the, when I do these things, one of the, the, the tragedies of doing these kinds of uh, press junkets and things are there are so many people involved with the movie who aren't a part of this, who give their lives to this movie for a year, two years. People like Beth Mickle, our production designer, our, you know, A.D. Lars, you know, these, and, and really Lars is the reason why we were on time every day, because he and I work together in a way that he helps to keep me under control. And he under, also understands the creative part of filmmaking. Um, you know, not to mention, you know, you know, our producers, you know, Peter and Chuck and Simon Hat, they help to keep that all rolling. So I think that we just, we just really scheduled the movie very well. And on days like that, there is time. When I say we goofed around for three hours, it wasn't three hours. It was probably, but it was probably 45 minutes, you know, that we goofed around or an hour. But it was worth, you know, that's part of making the movie. That part of, you know, one of the things that I wanted to do with this film was to keep it 
I didn't want it to be shot like over the shoulder, over the shoulder, <laughs> wide, master. You know, it just gets boring. I wanted to keep things alive. And that meant with the camera work. And that also meant with the actors when they're working together to keep it natural. Mm -hmm. And so that sort of improv and stuff, we actually don't have much improv in the movie, but doing that improv helps to make all of the other dialogue way more natural. And so that we have that feeling, it feels as if everything is improv, you know? Hey, and it, just, you know, also going off script like that is like ridiculous. You laugh your asses off. And it, it creates that camaraderie even more. After, I don't know, all of you guys probably know you've done it yourselves. You, you can't stop laughing. The more you try to stop it, the worse it becomes. So you just let it go, let it be free. And after a minute, it runs itself out. And then you're, you're, you're closer. You got a better scene afterwards. Yeah. I, 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 no, I just wanted to say, you know, playing a character that wasn't as well defined as a personality, you know, having James allow us to just, you know, do one take this way, now do a take this way, and now do a take, that really, you know, helped me, especially, and maybe Ratcatcher 2, Peacemaker perhaps, to sort of bring these characters out. Because, you know, that goofing around really, when you've got established characters like, you know, uh, Rick Flagg and uh, Margo, who do you play again? Uh <laughs> You end up sort of having to really figure out who your character is. And, and that was really part of James's technique is to just allow us to throw it at the wall. You know, and I got to work, you know, obviously with, with uh, uh, John Cena, you know, genius in the terms of improv. And so that really just brought the character out and the characters out more and more. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely, there's one particular scene but again, I don't want to do a spoiler, but I was like, I want to be there. I want to be hanging out with them. And I think that's like you said, it's the improv and the connection that you guys all have that definitely 100% comes across in the movie and it makes it so much fun to watch. But also John's bulge really like, I mean, <laughs> it really like brought us all together. <laughs> and all dick. All callback. Beautiful. Yep. I really just want John to stand up and just have the tidy whities on. Oh, I do. I do. Yes, it's uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, like a miniature gourd and a summer squash. It's, it's the best I can describe. Guys, I, I'm just surprised John isn't wearing his Peacemaker outfit because I, I couldn't heard... get it through customs. I couldn't get it. So this is the closest I could do. Is that true? <laughs> I heard two costumes disappeared from set. I, what are you talking about? I don't know. They, they may or may not be at the border. I don't know what you're talking about. I wouldn't want to show up to something like this in costume. I totally. <laughs> 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 professional today, John. Thank you. Know, you, but I, you know, I, I prefer I prefer that peacemaker costume. I might have lifted from set, but that's all right. Thank you very much. <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> okay, our next question is from Brazil. Kayo from Joven Pan has a question for a <laughs> Um, the character you play is strong, a leader, and fights for the people. How was the construction process to put that into a universe where most of the characters have superpowers? And if you could highlight a power, what would hers be? Um, it was really interesting because it's a different it's a different uh, character from the comics. But it was really good to talk to James because James had a pretty strong idea and references. Even of the looks, right, James, of how yeah. he wanted her to look in, into reality to really base her into to characters and women that do exist. I kind of like, without even speaking to James, I remember about this Curtis group of women that are fighters, but really specific, only a woman uh, of women. And I kind of like tried to get the strength for, for Saul from her. But James was great because he sent me a bunch of refs of this, this characters that do exist. So it was really, really wonderful. Like everybody said, because he had a, such a specific idea and vision, it really helped out to kind of just open myself to it. And, and I have to say it was interesting because I when I jumped there, they were already filming a lot. And the energy is exactly this energy. I remember like coming in and just, just saying like, this is a beautiful dysfunctional family because everybody is having so much fun and at the same time really doing the work. It was really, really wonderful to, to, to jump on board and see exactly what they said because I literally saw a bunch of pictures from set and there's not one that everybody's not laughing. It, it was even hard to to look at it because it was like everybody's cracking up all the time. So it was really, 
really special. But yeah, but the character was definitely based on the vision that James had, and 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 it was pretty pretty easy in that sense because he had such a specific point of view. It was wonderful. If she could have a superpower, what do you think it would be? Um, I think she's a survivor, right, James? I think like being in that world in those conditions, I think these characters are always powerful enough to be survivors. Like the Curtis women from like that I said that I took them as a reference. They're amazing fighters and deeply believe in what they believe. And I think that's a that's a superpower in a way. Awesome. Um, our next question is from Noel from Free Malaysia today. And this one is for Jai. Uh, what was the most fun you had while filming? Uh, watching Rooka struggle to swim uh, <laughs> was a lot of fun for me. <laughs> it wasn't your kissy yeah, faces he's... to Rooka? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, probably. We spent a bit of time submerged in water and uh, it was hilarious for a lot of reasons. And, I, you know, late nights, you're doing that a bunch. You often uh, have to stuff your costume with flotation devices. So seeing which parts of us um, hit the surface first was very stupid and very fun and, uh, and childish. And uh, yeah, I had a ball with that sequence for sure. There's a great moment in the water with you guys, Jai, where you guys are all supposed to be la like it's a, a moment we didn't use but where you guys are laughing at something horrible happening and the camera is panning around and, and it's like, Jai's laughing his ass off and Pete's laughing his ass off and Margo and Nathan. And then we get to, to Mei Ling and she's, she's drowning in her 200, her 200 pound <laughs> costume have, trying to really, stay. <laughs> there was no way for me to put a flotation device. There was nothing. And I was just like, and someone was on the ladders or holding onto something. And I'm just like this. Like, with swords, swords in her hand. <laughs> it's true. Hey, it's true. I, was I have you know. I want to put the record straight. Okay, I'm a good swimmer. I'm a good swimmer. Mongol's not. Really, <laughs> <laughs> let's jump over to you. I know that, like, you know, so many of these characters. Once they put on the costume, once you get everything in, it's so much easier to jump into the character. How how was that for you? Once you got into character, in or I mean, out. <laughs> she's the uh, the most badass person like character I've ever played so just putting on a helmet and the, uh, and her old purple gear and stuff even putting the makeup on you just get in and go fierce she was she was really strong and empowering I mean she looked badass and she looked you know very muscular and strong and could take and take on anyone even the guys it was uh, oh yeah man yeah. I was scared of you <laughs> with or without the helmet every time i come on set without the helmet he would just like tease the hell out of me like stick his hand on my gum <laughs> hey michael it sounds like you would have been scared of anyone while you were swimming i was i was, I was scared of, i was scared of myself <laughs> I think, uh, thank god the, sw the swimming pool was only like three feet deep <laughs> you're making it better for yourself <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, our next question is for the group. Um, this one comes from J David in Germany from TV Movie. Uh, he asked, there's so many insane action set pieces and memorable moments from the film, but what was your favorite to film or shoot? If anyone has one they want to jump in. The beach. Beach, All the, the battle the, at the, the beach. guns going off, the explosions. I've never, I've never witnessed. I've never been a part of anything that grand. That's explosions are going off way over there, and stuff's landing behind you. It just, it's, it was craziness. And then they'd say, "Cut, set it up, let's do it again." That was well. Not, not only that, I mean, we had a we had a real helicopter. I mean, come on, there's a helicopter coming in. And it's shooting, and there's gunfire, there's explosions. I'm picking sand on a, everywhere. I mean, it's ridiculous. And, and and by the way, there was swimming involved. <laughs> <laughs> well, people don't. A lot of people don't know we made that beach. That is on the back lot at Pinewood. It's one of the biggest sets ever made, and it is a, a an entire beachfront with an ocean that has working waves created by Dan Sudik, our special effects guy. And the beach then leads into a forest, which we also shot in as a forest. So we had this humongous beach that we created 
um, and uh, so that we had full control over it. But when you were there, you felt like you were on the beach. So in between setups, we're out there like hanging out, you know, not quite drinking margaritas, but feeling like we could. It was great. That's awesome. There was a moment when we were all wandering through the jungle and I had to deliver one of the hardest moments of the entire film for me where I'm talking about why my character is who he is and I'm standing there looking at almost everybody that's in this Zoom right now except they're off camera and if you don't know this, a lot of times when people are off camera, they just wander off or they don't give you a thousand percent and all of them were giving me everything that I could ask for with each of their characters and I still was kind of lost and I didn't know how to get there and James came down and put his arm around me and gave me some direction. And uh, to me, that summed up the whole movie for me. We're on this incredible studio stage, a giant jungle set, all of these incredible actors. And yet it was still this about the intimate relationship between these people and this director with this incredible vision, you know, having the willingness to come down and take a moment to just breathe with me and and, and let me connect. That's that. Did he say don't know this? this? Cause that's how he does it with me. You know what? He really he did that with you. Wow. I do that. I do do that with Nathan and Rucker because I've been friends and, I, and I'm giving notes to everybody. So like Nathan's on, you know. So I go around and I say something to somebody. I say something to somebody else, and then I I uh, uh, go to Nathan. And I say, "Don't fuck it up this time." Yeah. <laughs> and, and then he go, and then he goes back to his booth. He gets his megaphone. He says, "Rucker." What are you doing? No, <laughs> the other left. <laughs> I, mean, I, I feel like you can, you get to do that when you've known someone for so long and have fun with people in that way. Um, but uh, I love that, David, just talking about how, you know, you have the moments and the connections, but there's still those, even though it's such a big set and so many cast, you still can have those small moments in this movie too that are so special. Um, That's and, oh, go ahead. I was saying that's James. That's why it's a James Gunn film. That's all that spectacle and all that amazing shit is so cool to look at, but there's a beating heart underneath this film, which is going to shock and, and really move people in ways that they don't see coming. Um, and speaking of like the set pieces and stuff, the next question is for Joaquin and Juan. The palace where your characters reside in Corto Maltese is incredible. What did it feel like to step onto those sets? Okay, what? <laughs> My wife. <laughs> <laughs> Juan Diego, Juan Diego, could you tra translate for me? Sí, te preguntan, nos preguntan que cómo fue la experiencia de rodar en un decorado tan grandioso como era el palacio. Um, you go ahead. Get it all. You completely amazing, beautiful. amazing. Uh, the, 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 the trouble was you are from, uh, in front of a, a green screen, you know, a big green screen, and you have to imagine everything. And that was a, a, a very good proof for, for an actor, you know, because you have to, oh my God, this is a building. The building is, is coming down. And, oh, and that was a beautiful experience for, for me. I don't know, Juan Diego. See, sí, for me, the palace, same thing. I mean, I'm, you're used to do everything on a green screen and the palace was actually there. Um, it, was, it was this wonderful, beautiful place that you can touch the chairs, the the cartons, the weapons collection, everything was uh, was there. It was it was amazing uh, to to um, I mean the construction part in this film. It was it was incredible. At least the part that I had had to you know connect with. It was it was great. We had a lot of fun with that. Uh, I have to say there is a pretty incredible scene with you in the movie. I don't, I'm like I don't know what I'm allowed to say or not say. Or who has scenes together? Who doesn't? Um, you say anything you want. Give me a break. <laughs> Come on, please. Juan Diego, do you want to talk a little bit about? I mean, maybe there's some romance that happens. Maybe a pretty sexy scene. Um, I don't know how much I can, but yeah, I mean, I this guy. There's, there's a little bit of a romance between you and Harley. She's taken in. By yeah, her. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not all about John Cena's uh, stuff. Um, <laughs> you, have there's, to there's, uh, you have to there's you have other, to small, and then you have to have better than small. So it's all about comparison. Yeah, I mean, the character that I play, uh, General Silvio Luna, he's he has to. He's the new ruler of this called Tomates Island. And um, he's uh, obsessed with two things, his collection of um, rainbow lorikeets, lorikeets and um, Harley Quinn. And um, those two 
you know, obsessions uh, will determine his fate eventually. But fair enough? Fair okay. enough. He loves <laughs> Laura Pete. Like, like and we had a lot of real Laura Peets on set with, with Juan Diego and, and Harley, which is really cool. And yeah. I feel like really one of the hardest things we did in this film was not like the giant set pieces and the blo like explosions and all that and the stunts. It was resetting makeup <laughs> between <laughs> between our characters because when Harley kisses someone, it's like it's a it's a it's a mess afterwards. <laughs> the, the face yeah, something that we on but, their face. Something we haven't talked about much in any of these interviews, Margo, is how we changed your white skin. Like, we wanted to make sure that you were really, really white throughout the whole movie, which is what Harley is. And yeah. so that was a great idea when we were doing it. And then in the movie itself, <laughs> at times it ends up being a hindrance, especially when white is all over Juan Diego's face. <laughs> Harley just wants to make sure. Not it's complaining, not though. Not complaining. <laughs> it's like he doesn't have just a little lipstick on his collar it's like everyone knows harley's been there <laughs> yeah she leaves, she leaves him off he has his face and then margo's face on top of his face here so. <laughs> can, I, can, I, can i share a little tidbit that no one else would know apart from margo and i perhaps and our teams is that margo and i shared like, like a cabin and every morning i would i'd be like hey margo she'd be like hi and all i would hear is <laughs> standing there like freezing getting sprayed down oh man uh, it was our morning routine was, like a little divider i'd be naked on one side getting spray painted every day I'd be like, hey Andrews, what's up he's like hey like, how are you doing <laughs> you know, the makeup the makeup artist had a dog that would just jump in between she'd like half come in and be like hey what's up in here and go next door funny times bro funny times I mean, along with the makeup, there definitely is a lot of action in this film. Um, and we have a question from Geeks of Color in the U.S. Dorian asks Idris, how does the role of Bloodsport compare to other physically demanding roles you've had in the past? Uh, actually, the, the big interesting one for me was that James and I spoke about, you know, the sort of legacy of, of Dubois and how old he might be and how old we play him. And, you know, the trope is to play someone that's fit and ready to go. But I remember we had this costume fit in and uh, you know, we, we took weeks to try and figure out what the costume might look like, how it might fit. Anyway, we did this fit in and I said to James, doesn't fit like it used to. And he laughed about that. And we ended up sort of playing that. I don't know if it even got in the film, James, but I remember we played the idea that, that his, his, you know, He's been in jail. He's not as fit as he used to be. You know, he's an older dude and he, you know, and he's, he's still handy. So, you know, I've played characters that are at the prime, you know, of their physicality, but this guy, he was a little heavier, a little rusty. And, and James wanted to sew that into the fabric of his, his journey as a character. It was a lot of fun to play. That's awesome. I love it. I, I feel like it's such a fun thing because these characters are, like you said, mm. some of the lesser known characters or you can have a little more fun. You can poke fun at them. They don't have to be the perfect superhero all the time. So that's a definitely fun add in. Um, our next question is for Pete from Graham um, out of the UK at Game no Radio. Way. Yes way. Out of everyone, who do you think has the worst powers or ability? Uh, probably uh, me. I don't. I don't have any powers uh, at all. I just have <laughs> guns uh, that are strapped to my chest. So I, I guess me for sure. Uh, but I had a, I had a great time, and uh, the people on set were very kind about um, allowing me to hold the guns. Usually when I'm on sets and stuff, they take away the fun toys because I like play around with them and they were really nice and they let they let me hold them. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna ask, I was like, what do you mean? Um, <laughs> but James, how was that? Were you always constantly like kind of keeping an eye on Pete to be like, he, we need to take them away from him for a little while? Yeah, well, on the other sets, they told Pete not to be playing with guns. So it's really just... <laughs> We just need to make sure they weren't loaded. He wasn't shooting anyone. Oh, yeah. 
Um, how much fun is it for all of you guys? You can jump in here. I know, you know, you do films and not all the time everybody gets to be together like this, but even having a moment like this on this panel with everybody and getting to see everyone's faces, how great is that to get to experience a film and enjoy seeing each other and connecting like this again? That's right. In the private messages, we're just getting down, just so you know. Just like, yeah. <laughs> Idris, Idris just told me, you kind of look like God, bro, all in caps. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was there, I, there has to be like text chains that were going on on set between all of you guys when stuff was going on too I'm sure if it's happening here on the zoom it was happening there too there was some, well, we actually, we're, we're there was some pretty, interesting I mean, activity yeah, right. weekend activities very interesting uh we explored Atlanta thoroughly is what I'll say Good to see the <laughs> <laughs> I'm like mm, that's in the zoom chat for you guys <laughs> Fun game nights. We had some. We were. It was a wholesome yeah, group here. Night. Don't get the wrong idea, James. Yeah. Yeah. He was either one extreme or the other. It was game nights. <laughs> yeah, I have some. I have some deeply compromising karaoke footage. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody remember the cigar room that had the doorman with a knife that was this long on his hip? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The I red... still have weird memories about that guy. Red phone booth. Yeah, we hung out there one night, a couple nights. <laughs> you guys remember the, the strip club with the giant? Okay, I wasn't going to bring up the strip club. <laughs> that was the thing we were not bringing up, Idris. <laughs> oh, <laughs> now that we're in here, there, we went to a strip club <laughs> once, uh, and there was a bunch of, uh, it's like for older, there's, the, all the strippers are old, and they just the love. Claremont Joel. Lounge, bro. Yeah, <laughs> they just love Joel so much. <laughs> they didn't pay any attention to me <laughs> or Chai. <laughs> <laughs> Me and I were just sitting there, and all these old ladies were just swooning over Joel, and it was really fun to watch. I have to say, it was so funny because <laughs> Idris goes the strip club, and like all of people's Zoom's cameras started going off. <laughs> like I was like, "Are people panicking?" They're like, "I don't want to be on camera for this." <laughs> it was kind of amazing. <laughs> we'll get back on topic. So there's. Clown. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just. It was our home base. <laughs> Claremont Lounge, baby. The Claremont Lounge. I saw your crazy. mama get busy at the Claremont Lounge. Oh, stop. stop, I, had stop. A shirt, I had a shirt that said that. It said, I saw your mom dancing at the Claremont Lounge. <laughs> and I went to a rehab and they confiscated it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, do, I'm doing well now. It was, it's was it been two years. But like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tiffany, oh, for the record, Tiffany, for the record, okay. we actually oh. shot at the Claremont Lounge, so they were there doing research. Yes. Oh yeah, we yeah. really yeah. there. It's it's for like exactly. a, a yeah. mob yeah. yeah, yeah. One there. of our one of the one of if you ask me, what, one of my favorite scenes in the movie is the scene in the Claremont Lounge with with a bunch of these guys where they they sort of bond a little bit. It, it's it, it doubles for the interior of a, a brothel named La Gatita Amable. Uh, that's in Corto Maltese. We shot the exterior of, it, exterior of it in Panama City, but the interior of it at the Claremont Lounge. That was the scene I was talking about where I was like, I wanted to be there, but now hearing all of this, I'm like, maybe I didn't want to be there. <laughs> oh, no, let's go. No, you should. You <laughs> wanted to be there. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's, we'll, we'll bring it back around. We've got a question from Maria in Russia from Metro for Mr. Stallone. Uh, you play a very interesting character. What personal qualities of King Shark do you like the most? And do you have anything in common with King Shark? I like that he's on a high protein diet. <laughs> it works for definition. And I think he's actually he's more intelligible than I am, which is nice. It's nice. He has less of a slur. So we bonded instantly. Eloquent. He's eloquent. <laughs> That's what I call. I called up Sly and I said, "Sly, I wrote this role for you." <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, "What is it?" And I said, "It's a really it's a stinky dumb fish." Shark. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, okay. <laughs> yeah. No. No. It's great. I appreciate it. <laughs> what are you I owe you, me? James. No. 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 Next, the, the next Rambo, you're the first victim. 
first one. He's ready for the cameo. <laughs> I'm gonna, no, be, great. I'm, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be the guy that gets him. <laughs> uh, our next hey, question. I wanna be in the movie. Hey you sly, I wanna be in the movie, okay? And I wanna be the guy that kills gun. He he's killed me already three, four times already, so I'm gonna get back at his ass, okay? You know what? Right? Seriously, I can't function without you. So you're in. <laughs> for sure. Damn. Uh, no, I'm serious. This guy here has got more wavos than I've ever seen. When we were shooting cliffhanger, we're up at least 4,000 feet on a cable as thin as my finger. Now, I was terrified. I don't even like being in high cowboy boots. So I had to acclimate myself to heights. It's just, it's an unnatural thing, unless you're crazy like him. So he would go out on the wire and in the opening scene where I dropped the girl, that's really dangerous territory. So I would only do what was necessary. In between shots, I'd say, where's Rooker? He'd be hanging on the harness, sliding back and forth over a 4,000 foot gap for fun. Okay? So do not leave your children with this man. That's it. That's all I say. Worst babysitter ever, that guy. Let's hook up, let's go. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's the truth. I mean, it's some. I'm, he's fearless. But can Crazy. you guys tell, like, over this, you can tell how Sly's voice just permeates, like, everything so much more than anybody else's voice. You know, the funny thing is, James, I had this voice. I don't know why, because everyone else in my family sounds like parakeets. I don't know why. <laughs> but it, so I had this, like, at 13, 14, and I, you know, call up a girl and say, uh, the father would answer, go, hi, is Sue Ellen there? They go, excuse me, how, how old are you? I go, 13. And he goes, you better get your ass over here. And I'd pedal over there on a bike. So I looked like one of those, like these guys that would gargle with Drano. So I always had this voice that got me in a great deal of trouble. So I'm glad it's finally paying off. Right. Really appreciate it. I think I think you're I think you're good to go. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like I sound like an Italian pole bearer, but I get it. I get it. It's okay. <laughs> um, we've got one more question. This one is for John. Um, I don't. I'm like, do I want to ask this one? We're gonna go. We're going for it. From Steve in New Zealand at Flix asks, "Good Lord, that's a costume. What changes you when you dress as Peacemaker?" Oh, I think it's the ability to be peacemaker and everybody I got to work with on set, I think knows the difference between uh, who I am and, and certainly the character. Uh, I really just felt bad for James because uh, my favorite part of the costume is the chrome helmet, but it's the absolute worst because it's <laughs> EG everything out because it's a mirror image of all the cameras shooting back at you. So the thing that I really enjoy the most is the most ridiculous piece of the costume, but it was also one of the most difficult things for James. So. <laughs> Dude, the I mean, most ridiculous piece of your costumes are your tidy whities That's, it's just, that's no, just the baseline. I was, I was trying not to pull off operate. dick jokes. I had a load of dick jokes, you know? I saw, I had a, I saw it in a screening with like 20 people. And the first thing everybody said after the movie, besides it was great, was like, yo, Cena's dick is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, crazy is probably a good way to define my dick. It was all my all my uncles too. It was all my uncles that like love wrestling and shit. They were like, "Yo, I didn't know Cena was like packing like that, bro." Like, right? uh, thank, James, thank you for the filter. I appreciate that. I had, I had two demands. I had two demands. I wanted to keep a costume and I wanted him to use a filter on my dick, and he did both. What did your uncles have to say about Weasel's penis? Were they? Oh, they they laughed uh, a lot at Weasel. They they. They, they said Weasel, I think, was their favorite. And, well, they can't. I'm not saying anything else. <laughs> I was like, a, but no, all my, all my middle-aged Italian uncles are obsessed with your bulge. So I just. <laughs> okay. I feel like there's someone, someone right now is literally making an Instagram filter. <laughs> Oh, for awesome. it. Oh, for sure. I can't wait to see everyone using it. Um, we've got one last question, and this is for everybody. I want you to all answer at the same time, okay? Um, so this question is... 15 inches. <laughs> I'll count you in, okay, Pete? 
Uh, let's pretend for a second that James is the Amanda Waller of the squad film universe. If he came to you and asked you to go on another mission, would you go? Three, two, one. Of yes. course. Oh, yes. 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 I'm down yes. for any mission. Oh, says no. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, fuck them. No, Charles. Quick question, guys. If it's Amanda Waller, it's a suicide mission. That's the trick question. As long as I get paid this time. <laughs> that that is amazing um i was like there's gonna there's always gonna be one that says no but i i mean just from talking with you guys this whole time i was like i know most of them are gonna be yeses um james how does that feel for you like getting to have the freedom to create this movie like you wanted and then after the fact having the cast and everyone feel so excited and so like a family after the fact i, I, I love i love each of these guys each of these guys and gals as as people like very very honestly and as a director what i really loved about them is they were all so incredibly good and incredibly professional um the whole time and so prepared coming to set and it each created these these great characters that that's really where some of the magic came from those they're all my collaborator collaborators we made this movie together and all of them had something to add not so much rooker but the rest of them exactly <laughs> so i was feeling i was getting bundled together with rooker there and I i'm couldn't sorry i'm sorry oh, no, I, I gotta tell you i've never i've never been an adder or, or a giver i'm always a, i take as much as i possibly can <laughs> But it's really it's a it's a blessing. This is the best cast I've ever worked with, and it's uh, it's a it's been a real fantastic experience. And that's everybody from the people that acted, you know, for less time and more time, and every single person. Honestly, not a bad apple in the group for real. Well, I can't wait for everybody to see it and everyone to be able to talk about some of those big moments and big scenes that are in the movie once it's all out there for everybody. <laughs> um, it's such a such a pleasure to talk with all of you guys this morning. A huge, huge thank you for all of you coming out here, being on the Zoom with us, and for all the press for sending in your great questions. Um, Suicide Squad is going to be in theaters and HBO Max in the United States starting August 6th and various international dates starting July 28th. Thank you guys all again so much. I'm going to be going. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. <laughs>